Today, I am interviewing Dr. Paul Flesher, Professor of Religious Studies at the University of Wyoming. Dr. Flesher holds degrees from the University of Rochester, Oxford University, and a PhD in the history of Judaism from Brown University. In addition to serving as a professor of religious studies at the University of Wyoming, Dr. Flesher is also the director of the American Heritage Center, one of the USA's 10 largest archives. In addition to having published numerous journal articles, he has also edited numerous books and is the author of three of his own, including Oxen, Women, or Citizens, Slaves in the System of the Mishnah, published by Scholars Press in 1988, Film and Religion, an Introduction, published by Abingdon Press in 2007, and The Targums, a Critical Introduction, published by Baylor University Press in 2011. He also has three major publications in the works, including The Aramaic Targums in English, which is a new translation of the Aramaic Targums, The Development of the Palestinian Targums to the Pentateuch, and where did the scripture reader and the scripture translator stand in the ancient Galilean synagogues? Thank you for joining me today, Paul. I'm really happy that you can be here to share some time with us. You and I first crossed paths a number of years ago when I was preparing my translations of a number of the Aramaic Targumim for the Accordance Bible Project. Before we get into our discussion of the Aramaic Targumim, however, please tell us a little bit about your background. Did you come from a religious family, or what was it that got you into religious studies scholarship and the history of ancient Judaism? My parents were uh, devout United Methodists, uh, so I was brought up, uh, you know, weekly attendance at the Methodist Church wherever we were. Uh, when we moved, uh, you know, every few years, uh, the first thing we did was find where the church was and meet the minister and, you know, and then we went to school uh, and got, got <laughs> me enrolled in school. Uh, that, so that's what I remember as a child. Um, and, you know, and I sort of enjoyed church. It was, it was you know, whatever the belief uh, part of it, you know, I enjoyed the, the social part of it as well. Um, and, you know, read the Bible and went, went through it, you know, read it several times before, well before I graduated from high school, um, just because I just thought, oh, well, that's the thing you do. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, uh, when I went to college, uh, first semester freshman year, I took a course called Jews, Pagans, and Christians in the Ancient World. Um, it was an upper level course. Um, I was a freshman. There were no sophomores, mostly juniors and seniors and a couple of graduate students. And, uh, you know, it was sort of a seminar course. We had to write a big paper and do a presentation. And uh, that just stimulated whatever intellectual abilities I had and my curiosity um, uh, wound up being uh, the hardest work and the best grade and the most fun. Oh. Um, you know, I thought at that time, I thought I was going to be an electrical engineer. Uh, and, you know, I was struggling with physics and chemistry and math. But anyway, point is uh, that I did my presentation and paper on the Dead Sea Scrolls uh, and became one of those people that were fascinated by the Dead Sea Scrolls and off and on pursued them as an undergraduate. My master's degree was at Oxford, where I studied with Geza Ramesh, um, Sebastian Brock and others. But Geza as the, you know, scrolls person was, was the real um, draw for me. Um, by the end of those three years, though, when I was at Oxford, I had begun to realize that the study of scrolls, so this would have been the late 80s, um, the study, or, or the early 80s, actually, the study of scrolls was becoming more and more about deciphering fragments, looking at missing text, you know, whether it was just a few words or letters or a few lines and trying to recreate what was there and then interpreting them. And, and by the end of the three years, I decided I didn't want to do that. I didn't want to interpret my own imaginings, uh, however careful and scholarly they were. Um, and I didn't want to, you know, I wanted a text. I wanted it to be solid, at least to begin with. Um, and uh, got interested in the Targums. What got me interested in the Dead Sea Scrolls was interesting biblical interpretations, uh, 
telling us something about the ancient people who were reading the text and how they understood the text you know, for themselves, for their communities, and so on. And I found the Targums to be really sort of fascinating, having lots of those. Um, you know, it was sort of a huge field. Dead Sea Scrolls is sort of like New Testament studies. It's sort of crowded. There's a mm. lot of people working on almost everything. Um, and Targums uh, didn't have that problem. That's one of the things that got me interested in the Masora, actually. Uh, while I was at JTS, I was focusing initially on ancient Semitic languages, but as the department shifted um, to focus more on Hebrew Bible and its interpretation, which is really where the cutting-edge scholarship is coming from these days to a large degree, um, I began to focus on the Masora. There were so many works that I was familiar with from my studies on, say, the Pentateuch, where so much of it was hypothetical, and there was really no hope of ever really confirming any of the conclusions that were being posited. With the Masora, however, you're dealing with a final text, and you can debate that. You have empirical evidence. And that's what you're talking about, if I'm hearing you correctly, with the Aramaic Targumim. Yeah. And the other part about, say, Pentateuch was that, like you said, it was a very crowded field, like Dead Sea Scrolls. Masora, however, was essentially untilled ground. And that was one of the things that drew me into that. But I know firsthand that when you get into a field where not much work has been done, there are also obstacles. So what are some of the obstacles that you faced as you entered into Targumic scholarship? Part of it was, um, so this is the early 1980s. Um, and there were lots of discoveries being made. I mean, there was some of that new text you know, excitement that you get from the Dead Sea Scrolls. Uh, they, it was coming out of the uh, Cairo Geniza and the, the finds that wound up in the Taylor Schechter Library at Cambridge and other places. Um, and I was at Oxford. There was a few fragments there which I could look at. Uh, and so I got a little bit of that kind of excitement. But there were also whole texts. I mean, Targum Neophyte had just been published or was in the process of being published. I think maybe Deuteronomy wasn't quite out yet at that point. So I was looking at new texts and realizing, oh, there's there's entire, you know, entire long texts here, longer than the Pentateuch. Um, and they're complete in some sense. So that was exciting. Uh, they had new interpretations. Geza Vermesh was also working or had worked in that field and was willing to encourage me and give me guidance. Um, you know, I, I asked slightly different questions than he did, but uh, both he and, and some of his doctoral students, uh, I was just doing a master's at the time, um, you know, were, were able to talk to me and, and uh, we had interesting conversations and I made some uh, good friends uh, during that time in, in, in the field. So, I started trying to figure out how the texts related to each other because that, so I thought about Targum Onkelos and what its relationships were to the Palestinian Targums like Targum Neophyte. Uh, what was its relationship to Targum Pseudo Jonathan? Um, so I really focused on the Pentateuchal Targums myself. Um, I didn't really do very much work on the, on the prophetic or the, or the writings Targums. Uh, those seem to be closer for whatever reason, I sort of had this interest uh, in the Hellenistic period, early Roman, and late Roman too, even into the Byzantine period. Uh, so the Targums fit that, that interest as well. So Paul, when I'm teaching an introduction to the Hebrew Bible on, say, the college level or even at the seminary level, what I often tell the students is that the Hebrew Bible is, for all intents and purposes, um, in a close to crystallized format, by the middle of the second century BC. Now I realize we're leaving out, yes, lots of evidence from the Dead Sea Scrolls and that certain books like Jeremiah and Ezekiel and so on have not reached their final form. But by the mid second century BC, uh, with the completion of the book of Daniel, all of the texts that come to make up the traditionally accepted Hebrew Bible are now 
having been written in some form or another, when is it that the Hebrew scriptures start to be translated into Aramaic? When do our first Targums appear? The why is pretty clear. After the exile, the Babylonian exile, uh, when they returned from that in the late 500s, early 400s BCE, Jews are speaking Aramaic. That was the lingua franca of Babylonia. Most 99%, if not 100% of the Jews who went into exile died in exile, and their children grew up speaking the local language, which was a dialect of Aramaic. And for the sake of those who have never heard of Aramaic or don't know much about it, could you explain how Aramaic relates to the Hebrew language, the language in which most of the Old Testament or Hebrew Bible was written? They're both Semitic languages. Hebrew was the language of this small group of, let's just call them Israelites or Jews, in this small land. I mean, Israel is not a very big territory. I live in the state of Wyoming. It's not even half the size of my state. But Aramaic is sort of the English of the ancient world. If you think about how English is used today, you know, it's, it's uh, one of the major languages of international communication. There are more non-native speakers that speak English than there are native speakers that speak English. You know, it's the language of international travel. If you move through an airport anywhere in the world, it's going to have posters in English, not because it thinks a lot of Americans or a lot of British are going to be going through the airport, but, but because that's the one common language that the largest number of people will know. And so Hebrew never achieved that same status that Aramaic did. It was more of a local language. Yeah, Aramaic was exactly the same in the ancient world, uh, particularly in what we think of as the Fertile Crescent uh, from Assyria east from Assyria across the Fertile Crescent West into Syria, into Lebanon, into Israel, and uh, for several centuries down into Egypt. That was the language of empire. That was the, the most common language that people spoke and communicated in. So in that second half of the first millennium BCE, Aramaic was the dominant language. Hebrew was a local language. And what's interesting and, and we don't quite, scholars don't quite understand how it came about. But of course, after Alexander conquered the Middle East in the start of the third century BCE, the language of empire, I should say, became Greek. And it pushed down the existing languages. And over the next couple of centuries, Aramaic, or at least what I think of as Jewish literary Aramaic, became the language of Jews. And Hebrew became more or less the religious language. So that not all Jew by the time we start the first millennium CE, AD, Jews are speaking, when they're not speaking Greek, they're speaking Aramaic, and they're using Hebrew really only in worship. At least that's, that's what we see as we come into the rabbinic period which stretches roughly from the first century to the sixth or seventh century, depending on how you, how you define it. Many Jews actually spoke Greek. And indeed, there was a Greek Bible that was slowly being uh, created around this time. So was there really a need for an Aramaic Bible? The Greek Bible comes out of Egypt. The Greeks got into Egypt, and then the Romans really moved into Egypt, and the Romans used Greek in the early, in the eastern part of the Mediterranean Empire. Once they conquered Greece, Egypt was the next place that the Romans conquered. They really didn't get into Syria and Palestine for, for another, oh, I don't know, century or so. Um, so the Jews, particularly the elite Jews who could read and write, learn to speak Greek, because that was the language of empire. That's how they spoke to the biggest and the best and the most powerful. So they pursued Greek, and then that uh, followed the church, starting in the first century, uh, into Palestine. Uh, up until the church shows up, yes, Greek is the language of empire. Uh, you know, Herod speaks it, Josephus is writing in it, Philo is writing in it, but normal 
everyday Jews, you know, they've got traitors Greek. They don't, it's not their language. Um, you know, the Jews of the first, second century CE, probably, at least those who were in commerce, who were traders, who were shopkeepers, probably spoke, oh, I don't know, three or maybe four languages, enough to sell stuff to people, not that they were fluent or that they could write in it. Um, but, you know, if you visit Jerusalem today, you know, shopkeepers in Jerusalem speak up to 10 languages enough to sell stuff to, you know, it includes Chinese, you know, it includes Japanese, it includes Arabic and, you know, English, etc. You know, and maybe it's only a vocabulary of four or 500 words uh, for each of those languages, but it's enough to sell their wares. So when are the first Aramaic translations created? Okay, the first Aramaic translations, and I do make a distinction between Aramaic translation and Targum, um, come out of Qumran. Uh, there's a Targum to Job. Uh, there's some Aramaic texts like the Genesis Apocryphon and so on, uh, which is sort of a translation, but sort of not. It's, 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 it's part of that rewritten Bible idea that, that Burmesh tried to popularize and, and really has, has served the scholarship fairly well. Um, so you see it there, but they aren't Targums. They, they're a very different style. A Targum is really... I'm going to call it a rabbinic period text, but not necessarily a rabbinic text. What a Targum does, it provides a very exacting translation of the Hebrew Bible into Aramaic with additions. Some people call that paraphrase. That's not technically the definition of paraphrase. A paraphrase is same idea in different words. What the Targum does is it adds ideas, adds words and then goes right back to being exact translation, word for word, sometimes, you know, suffix for suffix. What is it that leads translators to decide at a certain point in a text that they are going to add an extra word, an extra phrase, or as, say, in the case of the Book of Esther or uh, the Book of Song of Songs, extensive passages? What is it that causes them to do that? So two, two points. Esther, Song of Songs, very late in the history of Targums. This is a debated area, but I put them 4th, 5th, 6th century as opposed to 1st, 2nd, 3rd century. Definition of a Targum in my mind. So if you think of what Midrash is, so just to take a rabbinic example, um, uh, the standard Midrash will cite the, the biblical text, often in Hebrew, and then it will, it's like a pesher, you know, if you think of, the, of Qumran uh, biblical text, cite the text in uh, Hebrew, and then it says, interpreted, this means, you know, and then you sort of put a call on there, uh, and then they give an interpretation. And Midrash, uh, rabbinic Midrash works very much the same. There's a clear distinction between a citation of the biblical text and its interpretation. And in, in rabbinic texts, they always label the interpreter. You know, Rabbi uh, Ezekiel says, Rabbi Joshua says, so we actually know, you know, we're crediting the inventors of the interpretation, or at least the tradents of the interpretation. The Targums are doing something very different. They are hiding the interpretation in the translation. If you do not know the exact biblical text in Hebrew, when you read the Aramaic, you cannot tell what is original to the Hebrew and what is added. I mean, sometimes the addition is long enough so that you can tell, okay, they're droning, you know, the, the you know, <laughs> it took 10 seconds to read the, the Hebrew verse and there's, you know, three minutes later, they're still, you know, trying, reading the, the Aramaic. Um, but you, if you don't know Hebrew and don't have the biblical Hebrew text memorized, you can't tell because the translator has woven the additions into the translation uh, seamlessly. I mean, there's some exceptions, of course, but that's, sure. that's the goal. So who are the translators of the Aramaic Targumim and what is the social setting in which they operate? What is the social sphere in which they're functioning? The social setting is the easy answer. Um, these, are, these are synagogue texts. 
if you read rabbinic texts, early rabbinic texts, like the Mishnah, the Tosefta, they talk about written targums a little bit, but when they say targum, they mostly mean the oral translation, Aramaic translation in the Torah reading or the scripture reading synagogue service. And the rabbis don't like Aramaic translations. They forbid them from being used, being read from in the text. They don't want it to be the, the Targum text to be confused with the scriptural text. If you think of it this way, it's a religious duty to listen to the scripture reading of the week. If you hear it in Hebrew, you fulfill your duty. If you hear it in Aramaic, but not in Hebrew, you do not fulfill your duty. Even if you understood the Aramaic and did not understand the Hebrew. So the rabbis do not like targums. The Greek text, they're okay with. In fact, they're fine. You know, if you're a Greek speaker and you hear the Greek uh, biblical text being read, that's fine. You satisfy your your rule. So they're really picking on Aramaic. Um, and I would argue that's because it's not their text. Which is really quite interesting because the Targumim occupy, you might say, a central place in what comes to be known as the Rabbinic Bible. Right. So, so put it this way, from the time of Solomon to the destruction of the temple in 70 CE, Judaism is primarily a priest-dominated, temple-oriented religion. And after the temple is destroyed in 70, there's an expectation that it's going to be rebuilt, just like it was earlier, uh, under Bar Kokhba. You know, that's, that, there's a Bar Kokhba rebellion right at the time that they would have expected it to be rebuilt. And the rebellion fails. The temple's not rebuilt. The priests lose their power base. They're kicked out of Jerusalem. They can't even be in Jerusalem. So the, the central area of, of Judaism in the land of Israel is in Galilee. That's not a great place from a priestly perspective. I mean, priests do live there. They go up there. Uh, there are histories of priestly families or continual mentions of different areas where priestly families settled and lived for several generations. So what is Judaism? Judaism is supposed to be at the temple. There isn't a temple. Well, you've got these synagogue things. In the rabbinic world, you also have the courts and the schools. And if you read the early rabbinic texts, like the Mishnah and the Tosefta, that's where the rabbis are. They're in the, the, the courts and the schools. That's why rabbinic literature is legal in, in essence. Um, and one of the things you discover is that the rabbis don't claim to control the synagogues. And that matches the Greek and Roman evidence that we have. We have lots of discussions about different uh, synagogue officials and the, you know, and there's various officials. They're all linked to the synagogue. None are called rabbis. Interesting. So when the Romans want to talk about Jewish leaders, they never mention rabbis as a, as a, as a title. Uh, I mean, I'm not saying that there aren't rabbis fulfilling, you know, some of the roles, but rabbi isn't a title that translates into the Roman world, into the Roman legal world, the Roman uh, textual world. Um, and what we do find is you look at the development of the synagogue uh, ritual, particularly the, the Sabbath ritual, is that priests are involved. So my argument is that we have an alliance between the priests and the lay people who are running the synagogue because uh, it's about lay participation. You don't have to be a rabbi to read or recite scripture. You just have to be able to read or have the text memorized. Um, and in fact, with Targum, you have to have it memorized. Um, you're not supposed to read it according to the rabbis. I think that, I think that rule was widely ignored. Uh, you see evidence of that even in the rabbinic literature itself. 
Uh, and I would argue that the construction of many synagogues, like the Nabratain synagogue, for example, showed that they had two platforms, one for the, the reader of the Hebrew Torah and the other for the reader of, of the Aramaic Torah. So you've done an awful lot of work on synagogue archaeology. Now, it sounds to me that that work in the archaeological field has actually informed your understanding of the origin and development of the Targumim. Is that correct? Yeah. So my two real research areas are the early synagogues, the early centuries of the synagogues, and, and, the, and the early Targums, um, you know, first half a century or so of, of, the, of the common era. And uh, when I started off in the early 90s, I treated those separately. Uh, I did a book uh, edited a volume uh, with Donnie Orman on, on the synagogue, earliest synagogue, and there wasn't, I don't even know if I mentioned Targum in it. Um, at the same time, I was working on uh, Targum projects, um, publishing, and so on and so forth. Um, I first put the two together in an article uh, at a conference in Lund, uh, uh, Sweden, um, which was hosted by Berger Olsen and others. And I have an article in here that I, based on one I gave at the conference, first time I tried to put together synagogues and targums, uh, dipped into, you know, linguistic theory to try and pull it off, talked about issues of language death, um, and uh, talk about the transition from uh, Jewish literary Aramaic, which is the language of Targum Onkelos, and I think is... Uh, largely located in Judea uh, to Jewish Palestinian Aramaic, which is the language of the Palestinian Targums, Targum the Afidi, um, and is essentially Galilean dialect. Um, and so I tried to put that back and forth. And that's where I first made the priest argument. Um, the, the, the notion of alliance between priests and laity as, as the social uh, group behind the, behind the Targums. So let's go back a minute to the question of the dating of the earliest of the Targumim. Earlier, you made a distinction between early Aramaic translations of the Hebrew scriptures and the Targumim proper, or Targumim with a capital T. Can you talk a little bit about that? I would say that um, a version of Onkelos is probably the earliest Targums. Um, and for the Pentateuch, Onkelos is a targum to the Pentateuch. Um, and you can see that Onkelos is used in the construction of the Palestinian targums, just say targum Neophyte there, um, and in the construction of targum Suda Jonathan uh, in different ways. Targum Suda Jonathan is quite a late targum. I'm going to call it fifth, sixth century. But I also want to make point that my point about the Targums coming out of a, of a priestly lay alliance talks about the early period, uh, in rab early rabbinic period. I think there's a struggle to define uh, Judaism after the destruction of the temple. And what's important about that, I mean, think about it this way. Okay, temple disappears. What's Judaism now? Anybody can offer an answer, you know, and while it may be hard to come up with one, I'm sure there was at least half a dozen different groups, two or three or four of which we talk about commonly, you know, the Greek direction and uh, et cetera. Um, but the question is who becomes normative? Whose ideas are accepted by everybody? And whatever the confusion of the first century or two after the destruction of the temple, ultimately the rabbis win. The rabbis get to define what Judaism is. And by the time you get to the Babylonian Talmud at the start of the seventh century, about 600, um, they are essentially in control. Um, and the Babylonian Talmud really has a full description, guide, it, it's not written in any of those forms, but it really becomes the basis for Judaism. Um, Judaism for the next 1200 years is based on the Babylonian Talmud. And by the time you get there, 
the synagogue liturgy is surprisingly well established. Uh, you know, it continues to change, but the basics are all there. The Targums have become part of the rabbinic world. They have disposed of them and slotted them in in different places. Targum Onkelos, for example, in the sixth century is considered to be the rabbinic Targum par excellence, whatever its origins. And the whenever we see the the, the writings targums um, except for the book of Esther which we know is early uh, are probably late at least the ones that we have there may well have been earlier targums that didn't come down to us um, but the ones we have are clearly rabbinic they they have lots of rabbinic characteristics unlike the targums to the Pentateuch and the targums to the prophets so there's a shift there. I, I see the early Pentateuchal and uh, prophetic targums as, as sometime between the first and the third century in their origins. So something's happening in the first century. We have Aramaic translations of the Hebrew scriptures, not many, but nevertheless, we do have some. And what I hear you saying is that some of our earliest of the Targumim may actually date back to the first century. So now some of our listeners who are interested in uh, Jesus and Judaism and, and the early Jewish Jesus movement would probably like to know, what does Jesus actually know about the Targumim, if anything at all? And what about the Apostle Paul? I don't think either of them know anything, um, just to be blunt. <laughs> Mm -hmm. um, in, in terms of directly knowing about the Targums. Uh, Jesus, what, when you read the, the, I think it's Luke 4, uh, Jesus reading scripture, Isaiah in the um, uh, synagogue, he's reading the Hebrew. At least that's certainly how it's presented. There's no translation going on, etc. He just stands up and reads from the Hebrew text. If you read the scholarship on Luke 4, they think it's late. Mm -hmm. um, I, I'm not enough of a New Testament scholar to offer a, an independent judgment here, but if that's true, then it's, you know, one of the, the back and forth about gospel um, scholarship is to what extent does the text reflect the church and the church's practices as opposed to, you know, the, the things that Jesus actually did and said. Um, I could certainly see the Luke. For, I like to use the Luke 4 passage. I teach with it. I've, I've lectured on it a couple of times. Um, but I wouldn't be surprised, um, you know, if the writer is imagining that, that Jesus is actually reading in Greek, that it's all happening in Greek uh, in his mind or her mind. Right. Um, you know, I, I don't know. I, I'm just throwing that out there. What is interesting, I think, that all these interesting biblical interpretations, there are some interesting parallels with scripture. Parallels in the sense of they look at the same topic or a similar topic and they have an opinion. And sometimes you can see that they're debating. That somebody has heard, you know, the New Testament one here and the Targum is debating it or like the Targum had sort of an original idea and it looks like the New Testament is debating. You know, that completely ruins the whole, uh, you know, chronological time frame. Um, um, unfortunately, chronologically, we can't put the Targums back into the first century. Um, I mean, maybe there's a proto-onkelos. I mean, I argue that there is, um, that is written by the priests before the destruction of the temple, 50, 60, you know, sometime in the mid-century. Um, and I say that based on the language. The language is very consistent. It sounds like somebody knew how to write a particular dialect and stuck with the dialect and just you know, did a good job. That assumes a school. That assumes teaching, uh, you know, that, that a school could give. That could assume a community of, of accepted usage of, of the text. Uh, and if you know anything about the history of, of modern spelling, it's only been the last century or so where we standardized English spelling. Right. Uh, and Americans standardized it differently than the British did. 
um, eh, probably century and a half now. But uh, you know, it's the notion that the grammar is exact, the spellings are pretty much exact. A um, little bit of variance, but not very much um, within pronunciation. Uh, uh, you know, variance of, of pronunciation. Um, both Targum Onkelos and Targum Jonathan to the prophets are really consistent in the grammar and in the dialect and in the spelling. And you look at that and you say, that requires a school, okay? That sort of says to me pre-70, because once Jerusalem is, you know, a school sponsored by the temple, who else has the resources? Uh, or, or, or the king. Um, you know, and after the destruction of the temple, you haven't got a central kind of place to do that uh, for the next century or two. Um, you know, the, the, there just isn't the resources. After the destruction of the temple, after Bar Kokhba and everybody moves, you've got a major refugee situation. And you don't have a United Nations that's going to, you know, send in people to look after you know, the, the refugees and to give them camps and to feed them, et cetera. They had to, to do all that themselves. You know, it's not the modern world. So Galilee was really disrupted um, in the second century and probably well into the third century. It wasn't an easy place to live. So now you've worked with Martin McNamara uh, who is perhaps best known on a more popular basis for his work Targum and Testament, in which he makes much of the connections between the New Testament and the Aramaic Targumim. And even in your book with Bruce Chilton, you have some sustained discussion of the Targums and the Gospel of John. So many of those listening who are students of the New Testament it, to one degree or another may be curious to hear more about whether the Targumim may have heavily influenced the Gospel of John, especially since you're saying that some of the Targumim may be pre-70, whereas the Gospel of John is not written uh, by, by most accounts until, say, the 90s. So is the Gospel of John, in your opinion, drawing from Targumic traditions, even if they're not written? maybe non-textual traditions that come out of the synagogue, that come out of the first century synagogue? Oh, that's a, that's a hard question. And I would love to be able to say yes. But what I would say is that, so Martin McNamara was part of, of the generation immediately following the discovery of Neophyte. He knew Alexandro Diaz Macho and um, you know, worked with him. He actually translated, did the English translation uh, uh, for Diaz Macho. And you know, there was a big, in the 60s and the early 1970s, a lot of push uh, towards linking early Christianity, particularly the New Testament um, and the Targums. And I'm part of the school that thinks that that was overdone. Uh, you know, I think there are connections. They are not the kind of historical interpretive connections um, that McNamara and his fellow, fellow colleagues and, and students wanted to see. But we are very grateful then to, to, to getting the interest and, and showing the possibilities uh, that of, of the Targums uh, because uh, scholars come out of the rabbinic world, uh, you know, Jewish rabbinical scholars of the Talmud and so on. They aren't really interested in the Targums. So uh, when this group of essentially Christian scholars um, started really showing an interest, it generated some interest on the Jewish side as well. You know, hey, wait a minute, those are our texts. You know, you know <laughs> they don't get to define it all. Uh, so there's been a lot of back and forth, and and I'm really quite happy about that. And and um, my early career, I was really skeptical of using Targums in New Testament. I I was very much trained as a historian and had struggled to get over the chronological problem. Um, today, I think there are other ways to approach this other than straight uh, chronology. Uh, uh, Bruce Chilton, I think, has done a lot of good work on that. 
Um, I happen to know right now he's, he and a couple of colleagues are working on editing, let's just call it a commentary on Jewish rabbinic and Targumic texts. And um, one of the key questions is, how does it relate to the New Testament and to um, early Christianity? You know, where, where do you see things coming together? One of my articles, I argue that there is a sort of a Torah-based theology uh, in the Palestinian Targums that gets picked up and carried into Suda Jonathan as well, um, where essentially the Torah is, you know, presented as both the standard for behavior, you know, worshiping God, um, and if you follow the strictures of the Torah, however you define that, uh, then you will find yourself um, not only in the world to come, but in the Garden of Eden, in, the, in heaven, in the world to come. And if you don't follow Torah, then you will find yourself in Gehenna, in the world to come. That there will be a judgment, and that judgment is going to be based on Torah. And that kind of theology, you can see, if you conceive it that way, there's some really interesting stuff in the New Testament. Uh, you know, there's this whole notion of behavior in this life leads to reward or punishment in the next life. Um, and there's a judgment in there by God, and there's a standard for that judgment. That kind of way of putting things together is a very Targumic way. It's also a very, new, uh, you know, early Christian way of putting things together. So I, I think it's worth playing about. There's, there's a lot of eschatology. I mean, there's there's a world to come. There's a Messiah who's going to usher in a new world. All of which make it into the Targum of Song of Songs, interestingly enough. Yes. There's a whole theological set there, which the, the, the Targums are not theological treatises. You know, they don't lay it out point by point by point, um, the way later systematic theology would do. Um, but if you know how to ask the right kinds of questions, you see that there is a common theology within them, uh, certainly within a single text. And then what you start to look at is that there's variations on that in other texts, uh, that, but there's a sort of a common core of ideas. And I think that is something that Christianity took from Judaism. You know, I can't demonstrate that in a chronological historical sense. Sure. Um, but to the extent that Christianity looks like Judaism, that's what it looks like. So if I'm hearing you correctly, it sounds like it would be better to say that the Targums and the New Testament are drawing from a similar pool of ideas or from the same pool of ideas that is circulating in first century Palestine. Certainly that is that much is true. Um, I'd love to be able to, to, to do a stronger connection uh, there. Um, and, and I'm doing a couple of articles for uh, Bruce Chilton's uh, book on, on Onkelos and on Neafidi. And uh, I, I can't say that I'm far enough into them to, to tell you what I'm going to see, apart from that sort of what I sort of call a Torah theology that I think is is echoed in different ways. And when it isn't echoed, it provides some really interesting comparative moments. Uh, you can see what kinds of theological choices that people made when you, when you bring the two together into comparison. Uh, and in terms of a, of a phenomenology of religion kind of approach, uh, it's really quite fascinating. If you've enjoyed this video, please be sure to subscribe to the channel, click the bell below to be notified when I publish similar videos, and please be sure to share this video on social media and leave a comment below. We'll see you next time, everybody.